everyone give it up. Give a warm welcome to my friend Stevens. Now, I checked with Stevens earlier, and I said, you're not going to, is this where you wanted it? I, I'm messing, I'm messing okay with enough. your furniture that's, already. That's good okay. and, and Stevens is like, no, I, I didn't bring any pictures, and I, I didn't bring any stories. So tech team, you can just not show them that picture that I had for you, okay? <laughs> oh. <laughs> you, know, you know what's amazing is this, is this is actually at the church we used to work at together, Rex Alliance, and I'm pretty sure I was like deep in spiritual thought, writing a sermon, praying, worshiping, and then I turned around and saw that on my window. <laughs> you can get rid of that now. Thanks, guys. So let me just pray for Stevens, and he's going to share with us today. Jesus, I just thank you. I thank you for the beauty of friendship, mm -hmm. of relationship, of iron sharpening iron and the way that Stevens has just been that in my life, just mentored and taught and called me out on stuff and yet sat and cried with me in loss and held me and just the beauty of the way that we have been able to experience mm -hmm. that bond together. And Jesus, I just thank you that I get to sit under his teaching today, and we all do, and I get to share uh, this great relationship with my new family. And in fact, we were talking, you know, just before the gathering, this is actually our family still, that we're the body of Christ. Mm -hmm. And so just bless him as he speaks. Would you speak through him in Jesus' name? Amen. Amen. Thank you, brother. Hey, Appreciate brother. That. Good morning. It's great to be uh, here with you today. Everything that Mark shared uh, this morning is, is actually true. Uh, Mark and I have known each other for almost six, 15, 16 years, I believe 17 years, somewhere around there. And it's been a great privilege of mine to journey with Mark. And I don't consider myself as mentoring Mark, but I really believe that we've come to the point where we speak into each other's lives. And I actually look up to him and I enjoy sitting under his teaching as well. So uh, it's great to be here. I, I really feel like I'm the guy that, you know, you invite on a date and you bring somebody home to meet your parents. I feel like I'm the one that, you know, meeting kind of the family now and I'm here so it's, it's great to be I'll try to behave I can't guarantee that uh, but yeah it's, it's really 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 good to be here with you Unfortunately, uh, my family couldn't make it this morning. Uh, they are in Toronto. They had the choice be between coming to Guelph or going to Wonderland. Um, so they're going to church, and then they picked Wonderland. But uh, I'm married to my, a beautiful wife, my wife Joanne, and we've been married for 15 years. And I've got two adorable kids. My son Jaden is 11, and my daughter Sabrina is 9, and they can uh, be here today. Um, but it's really, uh, I'm really glad to, to be here. I was born and raised in Montreal. That's where I'm from. So if you hear a little bit of an accent, that's what it is, a little bit of a French accent that I have. And it actually comes out sometimes when I speak. So if you hear it, that's what it was. And uh, growing up, I was one of the uh, people that enjoyed playing hockey. You know, being from Montreal, I am a diehard Montreal Canadiens fan. Yes, I see that. Yes, girlfriend, I see those two thumbs, yes. Um, but I, I must confess that Maple Leafs seem to be on the right track, picking up a few uh, players, and there's hope. There's hope. You know, I remember in high school uh, when I went downtown Montreal to celebrate the fact that we won the Stanley Cup, and that might come here maybe during a lifetime. So there, there, is, there, there is hope. There is hope for you. So I, I remember growing up uh, playing hockey, and I played hockey from the time I was four. Uh, and if you're somewhat observant and not colorblind, you might uh, think that this is actually um, different. Because as you probably know, there are not many people of my skin complexion that play hockey. Uh, but it's definitely something that I enjoyed doing. And I always stood out uh, a little bit uh, playing hockey. And I remember this uh, one time we were at a tournament and we, it was one of those games where we were going back and forth. We were at a tournament in the home rink. We were winning and it was going back and forth, back and forth. When we ended up uh, winning the game. So after the game, you know, like you threw your equipment and high five, you know, you're all excited and uh, good game, good game. And uh, I'm, I'm actually a goalie. I still play every Sunday night. I play in, in Etobicoke. And uh, back then, like, I had one of those, like, amazing games. You know when you're on and you're on? Yeah, that was my game. We won 2 nothing. I had a shutout. It was the MVP. And I, yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Um, and it was just amazing. I loved it. You know, and I remember at the end of the game, you know when you do the whole nice sportsmanship, you know, good, good game, good game to the other team. So we're giving the hands, you know, good game. We're saying good game, good game, bra. You know, we played, oh, I didn't say bra, but I said good game, good game. And... One of the guys, uh, as I was all excited, said, good game. And then he said some obscenities uh, followed by a racial slur. And I can tell you that right there and then, like something in me was enraged. When that little kid said something, my uh, young 12-year-old soul was just crushed. 
And I remember being all deflated, somewhat trying to put on the face, but being all deflated. And I remember making a vow to myself. I said to myself, I will never trust a white person again. Because this was not the first time that it had happened. And I felt like taking matters into my own hands and really uh, dealing with it. And I'm pretty sure that some of us here this morning, maybe you, you haven't been victimized by racism, but we've all gone through times where we've been hurt in one way or another. Whether it's a, a business, business deal that has gone wrong, maybe it's a business partner uh, that totally messed you up, maybe uh, it's a family member that gossiped about you, uh, maybe uh, it's a neighbor that you've, you've had some, an, an, encounter with, an encounter with that was not uh, helpful, maybe it's somebody that actually laid their hands on you. And when you uh, encounter situations that, like that, like how do you react? Do you forgive? Do you just forgive and forget? Do you just uh, go on? Do you uh, take matters into your own hands? Do you seek uh, revenge? And all of those questions are, are questions that people have been asking from time. And today, I'd like for us to, to journey to see how Jesus reacted and how Jesus is calling us to react when we're facing uh, situations like that. If you're a follower of Christ, you will see uh, the, the shocking way that Jesus is calling us to live out our faith. And if you're here this morning and you're, you're not a follower of Christ, that's great. We're, we're glad that you're here. And you'll just get a peek as to how a Jesus functions and how Jesus is calling his followers to react when they're faced with in situations where they've been hurt and when they've been wronged. In Matthew uh, chapter 18, the Bible tells us that Peter, who's one of Jesus' disciples, was, was talking to, to Jesus and was probably uh, dealing with uh, somebody that had offended him in, in one way or another. And he asked Jesus, you know, Jesus, if, if somebody messes up with me and, and, and they've wronged me, how many times should I forgive? You know, seven times? Because back in the day, you, the, the, the common understanding is that you were to forgive three times, right? If after three times a person still messes you, you're allowed to cut them out and, and you're done. So Peter thought that he would double that number and add one for good measure. He asked you seven times, is seven times good, Jesus? And Jesus says, no, no, not seven times, but 70 times a seven. Essentially what Jesus is saying is you should forgive every uh, single time. And, 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 and when I say something like this, some of you may be here this morning and may be like, you know what, this is why I, partially why I don't like to come to church. Because when I come to church, there's usually a guy or a woman speaking, and they say certain things that uh, causes me to feel all guilty and all ashamed because I can't live up to some of those standards. And you're in good company. C.S. Lewis, uh, one of the famous author, once says, forgiveness is a beautiful idea until you have something to forgive. And, and I think he's right on. Right? It's, it's nice to say that we should forgive. You know, maybe we should close in prayer, right? If somebody's wronged you, forgive. Amen. Let's start, uh, worship team, could you? Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's easy to say that we should uh, forgive. But Jesus doesn't just drop this bomb. No, no, he shares a story to, to talk about the crucial importance of forgiveness. And if you have your Bible, we'll turn uh, to Matthew chapter 18. We'll, I'll walk you through verse 23 to 35. Matthew chapter 18. And I'll walk you through uh, verse 18 to 35. Matthew 18, and I'll walk you through verse uh, 23 to uh, 35. And as I read this story, maybe some of you may be familiar with this story, and, and that's okay, but just pretend that this is the first time that you hear this story, right? Because as Jesus is, is sharing this illustration, his disciples had never heard that before. Some of you have, may have heard it, but just pretend that this is the first time they hear it, okay? So let me uh, walk you through Matthew 18, and I'll start at verse 23. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants, as he began to settlement, the settlement, a man who owed him 10,000 bags of gold was brought to him. Since he was not able to pay, the master ordered that he and his wife and his children and all that he had be sold to repay uh, the debt. See, this is a, a, the picture of a gentleman who had lots and lots of debt. So let's pretend that we have a little gentleman here, okay? Um, let's call him, I don't know, uh, what's your name, sir? 
John, let's call him John, okay? Uh, this is John uh, right here, and John has a massive debt, right? This is not just a lot, but John is pretty much like swimming in the, the magnitude of his debt, okay? J John is here, and you can tell by those jelly beans, which if you end up eating too much, is somewhat sinful. So l let's pretend that this is John's massive debt. And we, we all have been in situations where either we uh, owe people something or people owe us money, whether it's a, a, a bet, whether it's, 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 a, it's a, a car loan, whether it's, it's a mortgage. We all have been in situations where we owe uh, people money. And we there are actually institutions that are like that. When we owe people money, they're pretty serious about getting their money back, right? We have people like that, we don't call them loan kitties or, or loan puppies. We call them loan... Exactly, right? Because they're pretty aggressive in getting their money back. They're not messing around when it comes to uh, getting the money. And there's one simple rule when it comes to debt collecting, and the simple rule is this. You owe, you pay. Right? You owe something, you pay. John, you owe, therefore you need to pay up. That, that, that's how it works. It's a very uh, simple rule. But in this case of, of, of John here, in this case of the servant that we see in the Bible, we're, we're not talking about, you know, like he owes like a hundred bucks or, or even like five thousand, ten thousand dollars. We're talking about a, a serious amount of money. This is the, the highest denomination and the highest number, the highest amount of money in the highest denomination of uh, a highest currency. So it's as if we were saying that this guy owes a gazillion million dollars. Right? This is an expression that we use. He owes tons and tons and tons of money. This is the situation that this gentleman is in right now. So he, he knows that he can repay, that there's not much that he can do to, to repay all this debt. So the king orders now that his family be seized. Now you can imagine how his wife must have felt. Imagine that she's home and, you know, she's watching Netflix and the kids are playing in the backyard and all of a sudden it gets a knock at the door and as she opens the door, a gentleman shows his body. He's like, hi, are you Mrs. Mrs. John? What's your name, sweetie? Diane. Are you Diane? Yes, I'm Diane. Well, we're here to collect right now because John owes a lot of money. So, okay, gentlemen, let's back up the truck. Let's pick up all the furniture here. Yes, pick up that puppy as well. It's all going to debt collection because right now John owes a lot. And we know that there's one rule. You owe, you pay. Now, in, in the last ditch effort in order to, to save his pride, in order to save his family, the Bible uh, tells us that uh, this uh, gentleman, he uh, does, he's desperate. So in verse 26, we read uh, this. At this, the servant fell on his knees before him. Be patient with him, he begged. Be patient with me, he begged. And I will pay back everything. And he doesn't seem to understand. He, he wants the, the gentleman to be, the king to be patient with him because he thinks that he actually can put a dent on this. But if, there's no way that he can put a dent on this. He would actually have to work, uh, let's say that he made minimum wage. John, let's say that you make minimum wage. Uh, oh, that's just over, 15 bucks an hour. He, John would have to pay, oh, would have to work over 200,000 years in order to repay this debt. Over 200,000 years in order to repay this uh, debt that he, uh, that he has. And John is very cognizant of the reality that there's one rule when you owe a debt is that you owe, therefore, thank you very much. And recognizing that this servant, that John, there's not much that he could probably do to put a, a dent on this debt. The king does the unthinkable, something that none of us could imagine. Let me read you verse uh, 27. The servant's master took pity on him and canceled the debt and let him go. Okay, you, 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 you don't quite understand. Let's pretend that you have a car payment and a mortgage payment and a student loan and, and, I don't know, all sorts of debt, and you wake up one morning and that debt was completely canceled. You go into your bank account or whatever, you have nothing left. Imagine how you would gasp. You'd go, Right? Like, you couldn't believe it. So work with me here, and let's understand, let's have that reaction when I read this verse. Okay, let me read it again with you. The servant's master took pity on him and canceled the debt, the debt and let him go. I know. <laughs> Crazy, right? 
that he cancel the debt of this gentleman, this massive debt that he had completely wiped out. He could probably enjoy his family. He could enjoy his kids. This debt is completely gone. I remember uh, five years ago, my wife and I were celebrating our, our 10th anniversary, so I thought I would do uh, something nice and sweet. I booked a place up north. We went for a weekend, Horseshoe Valley, had a great time. We did a treetop trekking and really enjoyed each other. We had a great time. So at the end of our time, I go to the front desk to uh, settle my, my debt, settle the bill, and I, I pull up my credit card. She asked, what room? Mr. OJ, yes, yes, yes. Uh, and I pull up my credit card, and he said, oh, uh, Mr. OJ, um, everything's been paid for. Have a great day. I looked at my wife, I'm like, let's go, let's go, let's go. Just book it out before she changed her mind, you know? I just, like, booked it out of there. And, I mean, th this was not a big debt. We're talking about, like, a few hundred dollars, but still, I remember feeling like, what? Like, somebody paid us to be here. I don't have a clue who it is. But I was the, the, the beneficiary. I, I was the one who received it and enjoyed this debt. And I, I, I hope that you understand that in this situation, the king went far above and beyond. Because he uh, changed the rules of debt collection. The, de the, the rules in debt collection is you owe, you pay. But the king said, you owe, but I'll pay. I will take it upon myself. And I hope that you can see that this is a picture. This parable is a picture of the reality that you and I are in on a regular basis, that we owe an sorry, John, we owe an instrumental amount of moral debt, that for everything, for every sin that we've done, somebody has to pay. For every lie that we've said, somebody um, has to pay. For every time that we uh, cheat on an exam, somebody has to pay. For every time that we cheat on their papers, somebody has to pay. For every time that we looked at a woman lustfully, somebody has to pay. For every time that we uh, gossip, somebody has to pay. For every time that we were selfish, somebody has to pay. For every time that we put somebody in debt, somebody has to pay for every time that we did not stand up for somebody S somebody has to pay for every time that we're not good steward of our finances somebody has to pay for every time that we ignored the poor somebody has to pay for every time that you sped on the highways oh that was good so every time you sped on the highway somebody has to pay every time that you ignored your parents somebody has to pay every time that you disobeyed your parents somebody has to pay every time that you overate Ooh, yeah, we don't talk about gluttony a lot, right? But that's a sin. Somebody has to pay. Every time that you disobeyed, somebody has to pay. So every time that you did not take care of your body, somebody has to pay. Every time that you had sex outside of the context that God defined it for, which is marriage, somebody has to pay. Every time that we disobeyed and that we did not honor God, somebody has to pay. I mean, this mountain of debt, we, this is what we are accumulating on a regular basis. Yet the king steps in and says, you owe, but I'll pay. I, I, I got this. The king sent his son to die on the cross so that he could pay for all the debts that you and I have accumulated. This is how much he loved us. This is how much he gave his life for us by sending his son on the cross to pay for, for our debts. You see, we owed, but Christ paid. And I remember about 25 years ago when the king came into my life and said, Stevens, you owe, and I know, but I, I'll pay. I, I've taken it upon myself, and my son has died so that your debt can be erased. And maybe you're, you're here this morning, and that's, when, that's where you find yourself, that you realize that there is, there's an amount of debt, of, of moral uh, debt that you owe. And maybe you're saying, you know what, I, I realize that, and there's no way that I could put a, a, a dent in my debt. And maybe you do want to receive the offer that this king wants to give you. And at the end of the service, I want to give you an opportunity to do just that. To make this king the king of your life. And you would have thought that this is what the servant in the story has done. Right? That he received this forgiveness and this forgiveness completely transformed who he was. 
But what happens next, friends, is shocking. If you look at uh, verse 28, but when that servant, that servant who was forgiven, Johnny, he, right here in our story, when that servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred silver coins. And a hundred silver coins, friends, it's, I mean, it's, it's a lot, but it's not a lot, right? C -c compared to, to, to what this old, like a hundred silver coins is, is not much, right? In keeping with our analogy, if you're making $15 an hour, it's around 10 grand, $10,000. Don't get me wrong. $10,000 is no pocket change. If you have that and you're ready to, 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 to give it out, hook a breath up, okay? But compared to this mountain of debt that you have, like, you know, like this small grand, those bag, what, what you over there is not very much. Yet what happens next is, is, is crazy, friends. He grabbed him and began to choke him. Pay back what you owe, he demanded. He grabbed him and began to, began to choke him. Pay back what you owe me, he demanded. I know. Like, really? Like, you've been forgiven all this, and now you find somebody that owes you this, and you want to choke the guy? His fellow servant fell to his knees and begged him, be patient with me, and I will pay it back which you, you think would, he would have clued in because that's exactly what he said to the king, right? When he saw the king, he's like, you know, be patient with me and I won't pay back, please. Like, you know, like, help me out, hook a brother up, be patient with me. And you thought that little Johnny here would have said, you know what, yes, deja vu. I remember saying those words to the king and you know what, you're totally right. You, you thought that this is how he would have reacted. But verse 33 is a killer. Verse 33 right here. He says, but he refused. Instead, he went off and had the men thrown in prison until he could pay the debt. Seriously, like, this is how much you owed, yet somebody owes you this, and you get the man thrown into prison? And some people who saw that unfolding, they couldn't believe their eyes because they, they knew what happened a few minutes ago, right? So they go back and tell the king, king, I mean, your majesty, you wouldn't believe what just happened. Remember little Johnny? Yes, he's nice. Remember his wife, Diane, that you spared and their dogs? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know what happened? Somebody owed him like just 10 grand, like nothing compared to what they owe And you know what he did? He choked the guy, got him thrown into prison. Thank you. <laughs> right, Diane? Thank you. So the king now steps in. Verse 32. Then the master called the servant in. You wicked servant, he said. I canceled, I canceled all the debt of yours because you begged me. Shouldn't you, have, shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? And this is where we see the first reason why Jesus is calling us to forgive. Because forgiven people forgive people. Forgiven people forgive people. You see, what the king is saying, the emphasis in the Greek, the emphasis of that verse is, I've canceled all your debts, everything that you have there, every single one, even the black ones that nobody likes, yes, I've canceled all of your debts. Now, shouldn't you have had mercy on somebody else? You see, if you have received this forgiveness, you, you, your life will be transformed, Peter. And the way that this will be expressed, Jesus is saying to Peter, is that you will show mercy and grace to other people. In other words, what Jesus is saying to Peter is forgiven people forgive people. Forgiven people forgive people. Paul says the same thing in Ephesians chapter 4, uh, verse 32. E Ephesians chapter 4, verse 32. What Paul says is this. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other. How? Just as in Christ, God forgave you. Because in Christ, God forgave you. Therefore, you go and forgive others. Because you've received this forgiveness, you go and forgive others. See, when we uh, look at the, the servant right here, when we look at, uh, at Mr. Johnny here, it's, it's easy for us to say, come on, bro, really? Like, come on, you're, you're pushing it. 
Th that being said, I don't know about you, but I know that I can't relate to him. Like, how do you react when you, you lend somebody money and they said, you know what, uh, could you spot me for $20 and I'll, I'll get you back next week. And next week happens, they, they haven't returned it. And a month happens and they still haven't returned it. And two months happens and they still haven't returned your money. Yet you see them, you know, going out for lunch and every other day, you see their new phone and you see their new car and something in you is like, man, bro, where's my money, man? You may not choke them physically, but in your mind, you choke them. I think many of us can relate to uh, this person. I know uh, for me, I, I, I can totally relate to him. Because even though I know the truth of God's word, even though I know that forgiven people uh, forgive uh, people, I find that I often align myself with the thought of the enemy. I align myself with what the enemy says instead of focusing on what uh, God says. And I start taking matters into my own hands. I start choking people in my mind. And there are different, different ways that this uh, plays out. You know, have you ever said, you know what, you're going to pay for this? Anybody has ever said that? Okay, maybe I'm the only one. You guys are, oh, Mark, I see, I see that hand too, drummer boy. Yes, you know, we, we, we say those things. And maybe you, you don't say it, you know, you're going to pay for this. But you react in such a way that shows that you're, you're making them pay. You see, I, when my wife and I get into uh, an argument, I am the one who will like stand in my corner and I'll pout. You know, she, she is good. If I ask her for forgiveness, you know, it's done and dealt with. But for me, like I, you know, I, I, I'll make her pay. You know, I'll give her the cold shoulder. I will make her feel the, the intensity of the pain that she's caused me. Therefore, I stay in my corner and I pout. And as Mark and I were having uh, one of our chats in, in, in the hot tub, Mark, can I share something that's supposed to say in the tub? Anyways, I'll share it anyways. So uh, w one of the things that Mark uh, told me is he may not pal, but what he does is what's called the grab and roll. Okay? This is when you're in bed with your spouse and you get into some sort of an argument and you just grab your comforter and you roll. You know, like you're, you're done, right? You're making them pay. You're giving your back, you're making them pay for what happened. Maybe when they, they text you, you don't return their text anymore. You, you see them, you're trying to avoid them. You, you, you're just distant. You're making them pay by distancing yourself from them. Maybe you say, you know what? I don't get mad, but I get. Yeah, you keep some sort of, maybe not like literally, but you keep some sort of, of mental score of how things are. Okay, you hurt me now? Watch your back, because I'm going to get you back, man. I'm going to screw you over a business. I'll do something and get you back. Maybe, uh, like me, you make vows. You know what? I will never forget what you've done. I will never forgive you. I will never talk to you. I will, this is done. You make uh, vows. Maybe you align yourself with the thought of the enemy by saying, you know what, Stevens? They didn't earn my forgiveness. And you, you might be right, right? Maybe what, because of what they've done to you, they, don't, they haven't earned your forgiveness. That being said, you don't need to live with the resentment and the bitterness and everything that comes with unforgiveness. Maybe you, you say, I'm not ready to forgive. I'll forgive when I'm ready. The reality is, you'll never be ready. That's something that we say to make us feel better, but you, you, you'll never, it's like, almost like having kids. You'll never be ready for kids, right? It's just something that you say. Well, amen, Mark, you see it, yes. Maybe another thing that you, you believe is you say, you know what, I'll forgive when they apologize. And I'm not talking about, like, um, I'm sorry if I offended you. You know, like my wife used to say that to me, like, I'm sorry if you feel, what do you mean if? I mean, you see me, you know I'm hurt. What do you mean I'm sorry if you feel hurt? And you're not even sorry that for what you've done. You're sorry because I feel, that's, that's no apology. Or, I, I'm sorry, but if you hadn't done so and so, I wouldn't have so and so. If you're going to apologize and add a but, there's no apology there. Okay, just, if you're going to apologize, be straight up and apologize. But don't add a, I'm sorry, but, yeah, because everything after that is completely gone. That, that being said, do you need somebody to apologize for you to forgive? What if that person is no longer around? What if the person is dead? Forgiveness is not dependent on somebody's apology. 
And I know that this is a, a journey that I'm on. Because like I told you early on, when my wife uh, does something to me, you know, like a mm, cold shoulder and I, I pout, and if she says, or when she says I'm sorry, in my mind, this is the beginning of the process of me considering of whether or not I will forgive her. I, I'm just beginning. If she does something to me and I ask her forgiveness, boom, done, dealt with, move on. But when she does something to me, and I'm not saying it, it's right. As a matter of fact, I know it's wrong. And this is where God has me on the journey saying, Stevens, the fact that you don't, want to, you don't want to forgive your spouse has nothing to do with her. Your soul is wounded. You are the one that's hurting. You need to wrestle with that. And now I've been on a journey. Another thing that we uh, think is we say, you know what, if, if I forgive the person, doesn't that give them the license to do it over and over again? Let, let me give you an example. Let's say that um, I send my kids over to your house. Sue, right? Sue? Yeah. I like that, eh? Sue, I send my kids over to your house for a sleepover. My kids go for a sleepover, uh, and I come and pick them up the next day, and I notice that my kids have a black eye. Actually, I might not notice that. Let's say that my kids are hurt. <laughs> Right? Let's say that my kids are hurt somehow, uh, some way. Right? N now, if you're asking, hey, can I have your kids again the next day? I may not trust you. I may not entrust my kids to you. I might forgive you, but forgiving you does not mean that I trust you. It does not mean that I need to entrust my kids to you. There's a difference between forgiveness and trust. And some of us may be in situations where uh, the, the situation that we're in is actually dangerous. And the best thing to do may be to remove yourself from that situation in order to deal with it properly. Forgiveness and trust are two completely uh, different things. And maybe uh, what you're saying is, Stevens, what they did is unforgivable. I've been so hurt. Like, you don't understand, Stevens, the pain that they have caused me. And you know what? I don't want to stand here this morning and pretend that I do understand, because you're completely right. I do not understand. I don't understand how much it hurts you. I don't understand what it's caused you, and, and, and I don't understand the, the pain and the, 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 the wounds and the scars that you still have from it. You are completely right. I won't even pretend that I do. That uh, being said, it doesn't mean that you should keep going with your pain. Refusing to forgive is only adding to your pain. Somebody once says that bitterness, which is unforgiveness, is like drinking poison and waiting for the other person to die. You're drinking and you're hoping that they're going to be gone. No, you're only hurting yourself. Even though you know, holding on a grudge might feel good at the time, but reality is, when you hold on a grudge, part of how you can become is you can become uh, resentful, uh, bitter, joyless, untrusting, violent, uh, vengeful, self-absorbed, uh, cynical, spiritually uh, dry, uh, defensive, and those uh, are just a small list of some of the detriment of unforgiveness. Is that the kind of person that you want to be? You know, maybe there is something to the idea of forgiveness. Maybe there is something to the idea of uh, forgiveness. If you look at, at history, I mean, we've seen entire uh, nations and countries at war because of unforgiveness. If, if you um, look into some of your families, you've seen some family splits happening because of unforgiveness. Some of you are here, you're here this morning, and you've been in churches where completely a church has split because of unforgiveness. Friends, maybe there is something to the idea of uh, forgiveness. Because, see, when, when you don't forgive, you're the one that's bound. You're the one that is held captive. You see, when I do the, the grab and roll, and I'm all upset at my wife, and I'm reliving everything that she said and what she did and how much she hurt me and she wounded me, and I'm getting all vexed and all worked up and my veins are popping in my head, she's sleeping. <laughs> like, she's, she's on her third dream. Like, she is gone. But I'm getting all worked up here, reenacting everything that happened. Which leads me to our second point. Forgiven people are set free. Forgiven uh, people are uh, freer. Uh, free from the hold that you're allowing the other person to have on you. You're free uh, from all the effects of unforgiveness. But most importantly, you're free of but ultimately, you're free uh, from the desire to execute justice, to make things right. 
You see, in our story, uh, our, our, the, the servant, the person, he really wanted to make things right. He was owed some money. It was, it's true. He was owed some money. He wanted to make things right. But the way he went about it was wrong. Therefore, he ended up in jail. Verse 34 tells us, In anger, his master handed him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay back all that he owed. See, when we don't forgive, we are the ones that end up in bondage. And ultimately, we are the recipient of the justice we so long for. Verse 35 says that this is how my heavenly Father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother or sister from your heart. You see, our, our desire to make things right is right. It's a great desire. A desire for justice is right, but the way we go about it is wrong. The Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 12 uh, tells us this, the same thing. Romans chapter 12, uh, verse uh, 17. This is what he says. Do not, do not repay anyone evil for evil. So what he's saying is what happened to you is wrong. What happened to you is uh, evil. How it, it, he messed up with your family, how he messed your business deal, that is evil. It's not nice. It's not like, oh, let's, uh, let's forgive. No, no, that is evil. What he's saying is do not repay evil with, for evil. Verse 18, if it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. You do your part. You forgive. You do your part because in order for you to be reconciled, you have to forgive. That being said, reconciliation depends on both of you. So you do your part. You forgive as far as it depends on you. Verse 19, do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath, for it is written, it is mine to avenge, and I will repay. And if this was the King James Version, it would say, saith the Lord. Right? We need to make room for God to act. Part of what forgiveness requires is for us to do our part. That being said, we need to trust that God is a, a God who is just, that God is a God who is merciful, that God is a God who is loving, and that in every situation in our lives, he will do what is loving and merciful, but he will also do what is just. But often, we, we feel that God needs some help, right? We, we feel like stepping in, like, God, let, I got this. Let, let, me, let me handle this. We, we want to help. But let's allow God to be God, and let's do our part, which is to forgive. But what does it mean to forgive? What's a, a definition of a forgiveness? I found this a definition of forgiveness that I'd like to read to you by a, a lady by the name of Rachel Dan Hollander. Let me uh, read it for you. It's going to be on the screen as well, so you can follow as I read. Forgiveness, it means that I trust in God's justice and I release bitterness and anger and a desire for personal vengeance. It does not mean that I minimize or mitigate or excuse what the person has done. It does not mean that I pursue justice uh, on earth any less zealously. It simply means that I release personal vengeance against the person and I trust God's justice, whether he chooses to meet that out purely eternally or both in heaven and on earth. What a great definition of what forgiveness is. Yeah, you, you read that, and some of you may be listening to me right now, and it's like, Stevens, you know, th this is what I, I don't like about you Christians. You, you come here, and you share some nice words that all looks nice, but this, does this work in real life? Like, is this something for real? I mean, it's nice. Wow, well-crafted. Ooh, Rachel Denholander, bravo. But it's, it, it is, can I really apply this in my life when I've been hurt, when I've been wounded, when I've been abused? Can, does this work? Some of you uh, probably heard of the, a man by uh, the name of Larry Nassar. He was the team doctor for the U.S. national gymnastic teams and uh, osteo osteopathic uh, physician at Michigan uh, State University. He was accused of having molested over 250 girls and young women earlier this year. And some of his victims are as young as six-year-old. And I have a nine-year-old daughter who does gymnastics, and when I read this, like something in me was not feeling right, for lack of a better term. And when he was accused early on this year 
One of the first person that took the stand is Rachel Dan Hollander. She was the one that was repeatedly molested by this. She was one of the ladies that was repeatedly molested by Larry Nassar. And she is the round that she is the one that wrote the definition of forgiveness. So now that you know who wrote it, let me read it again. So that you understand that this is not just some eerie, fairy, nice words. No, no, this is something, somebody that has lived it out and has gone through it. Let me read it again for you. Forgive me, it means that I trust in God's justice and I release bitterness and anger and a desire for personal vengeance. It does not mean that I minimize or mitigate or excuse what he has done. It does not mean that I pursue justice on earth any less zealously because there might be some other victims, right? Therefore, it doesn't mean that you just stay there as a doormat and you don't do anything. No, you call the police, you do what needs to happen. It simply means that I release personal vengeance against him and I trust God's justice, whether he choose to meet that out purely, eternally, or both in heaven and on earth. And as she took the stand, Rachel Dan Holender, she led into Larry. And you could go on YouTube, you could see uh, what some of the words that she shared. But I'd like to share you just a snippet of what she shared to Larry at Nassar. This is what she says to him. In our early hearings, you brought your Bible into the courtroom and you've spoken of praying for forgiveness. And so, it is on that basis that I appeal to you. If you've read the Bible you carry, you know the definition of sacrificial love. It is portrayed by God himself, loving so sacrificially that he gave up everything to pay a penalty for the sin he did not commit. He, we owed, he paid. That's partially what she's saying here. By his grace, I too choose to love in this way. Forgiven people, forgive. You spoke of praying for forgiveness, but Larry, if you've read the Bible you carry, you know forgiveness does not come from doing good things as if good deeds can erase what you've done. It comes from repentance, which requires facing and acknowledging the truth about what you've done in all of its utter depravity and horror without mitigation, without excuse, without acting as if good deeds can erase what you've seen in this courtroom today. If the Bible you carry says that it's better for a stone to be thrown around your neck and for you to be thrown into a lake than for you to make even one child stumble, you have damaged hundreds. The Bible you carry speaks of a final judgment where all of God's wrath and eternal terror is poured out on men like you. Should you ever reach the point of truly facing what you've done, the guilt will be crushing. And that is what makes the gospel of Christ so sweet. Because it extends grace and hope and mercy where none should be found. And it will be there for you as well. I pray you experience the soul-crushing weight of guilt you may someday experience, uh, so that you may someday experience true repentance and true forgiveness from God, which you need far more than forgiveness from me. But I, I offer you that as well. <laughs> Again, what an amazing explanation and display of what true forgiveness looks like. This is the kind of, of forgiveness that Jesus is inspired to offer to others so that we could be set free. But how do you do that? What does that look like uh, practically? I'd like to end our service today by uh, allowing you, by, by guiding you into a prayer that can help you uh, forgive others. And this is not the prayer, this is not the be-all, end-all, this is not the way to do it, but this is a way that God has inspired me, that I've been journeying on as I'm learning to forgive others. So what I'd like for us to do right now is uh, maybe to close our eyes and, and ask the Holy Spirit to reveal somebody that he's calling you to forgive. I'm not asking you to go back to your childhood memories and do an inventory. That's not what I'm asking you. Just ask the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, he's, uh, God is a good father. He will give us uh, things as we need. Just ask the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, who uh, is it that you're calling me uh, to uh, forgive? 
And Holy Spirit, as uh, we are here today, I pray that you would uh, bring people, that you would bring uh, people's circumstances in mind from our church family that you want us to release so that we can be set free. I'll give you a few seconds just to think about it. Who's one person or people that you need to forgive? And if nobody came to mind, that's okay. Maybe it's not the right time right now. Uh, but if somebody came to mind, I'd like to lead you through uh, an exercise here. And I will put up the phrase, and I will walk you through this prayer to talk about exactly what this means. Here's, uh, here's how I go. Since you forgive me, I trust you and choose to be set free by forgiving. And then you put the name of the person. Since you forgave me, in, in the light of, of everything that you've, uh, that you've forgiven me, all my sins, past, present, and future, you are uh, the one in the, in the light of this unsurmountable debt that I could not repay. Since you forgive me, I lay down my hurts. I don't want to minimize what happens. Maybe it's caused you PTSD. You've had to go through years of the counseling. You still uh, suffer from the effects of what has happened to you. I don't want to minimize what happens to you. I, I lay down my hurts. They've hurt you deeply. They've ruined your business. They've ruined your career. They've messed up your family. I lay down my hurts at the foot of your cross because you entrust them to Jesus. I uh, trust you. I trust your uh, character. I trust that you are a loving God, but I also trust that you are a just God. And I reject the idea that it's, it's me uh, and that I have to do the whole debt collection, that it's, I have to take revenge into my own hands. I reject that, and I choose to be uh, set free by forgiving and in the name of the person. See, often we will pray, God, help me to forgive. No, friends, God has already made the provision for us to forgive. And forgiveness, like love, is a choice. It's a decision that we make, that we choose to forgive. I release the emotional stronghold that they have on my life, and I, re and I release myself from the, the grip that they have on me, and I entrust them to Jesus. And it may be something that you have to do over and over again, right? Jesus said, 70 times 7, and sometimes, friends, you have to forgive the same offense like over and over and over again. I remember a friend of mine, Ridge Biller, who in his teens uh, was going on a hunting trip with his friends, and he got shot in the back accidentally by one of his friends. And as a result, he would not have the, the, the use of his legs, and from ways down, he was completely paralyzed. Till this day, he's completely paralyzed. And at the time when it all happened, he forgave his friends, you know, that, that happened, and it was all good, he got married, but around his 40s or 50s, he had this surge of, 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 of anger that came out, and what he realized is he hadn't fully counted the cost, because now he realized that he wouldn't be able to have kids, nor grandkids, and he realized the effects of what had happened, therefore he had to go through another wave of forgiveness. So right now, I want to give you a, some, a moment to go through that exercise where you can at least begin that journey of forgiveness. We'll sit in quiet for a few minutes, and may I encourage you, as that uh, prayer is, is up on the screen, may I encourage you to go through that. Since you forgave me, I trust you and choose to be set free by forgiving you. I want to give you a few moments to reflect on that. A few years ago, um, a few years ago, I, I was sexually abused by a family member. And I've been on such a journey myself to forgive. And a friend of mine gave me an illustration uh, as I've been on that journey. He says, you know, like sometimes we need to take those hurt and prayers like this and write it down, put it in the box, and we need to uh, journey and drop it at the foot of the cross of Jesus and, and, and go back and, and write down some more stuff and journey and, and, and drop it at the foot uh, of Jesus. And, and the journey between my pain and, and the foot of the cross, friends, is, is a well-worn path. 
That being said, I know that there will come a day where I may still have the wounds, but the pain and the hurt will not be there anymore. And I'm telling you this not because I want to be nice, and no, because I look at the life of Jesus. The, the wounds were still there. When he came back, the wounds were not gone, yet the pain was gone. So friends, as we move forward, may you know that there will come a day as you journey between your pain and, and the foot of the cross, where you will be set free as you release that to other. Let me pray. Let me pray as we end. Let's stand as we pray. Father, thank you for your love. Thank you that you are a daddy who journeys with us. Thank you that you are a father who is with us in the midst of our pain. And that you're not telling us to go where you haven't gone. But in this journey of love, you walk and you journey with us. And I pray that as we uh, walk out of here, that we weren't first and foremost, we'll thank you for your forgiveness. The fact that we have been forgiven so much. And as a result, we will be set free by forgiving others. I thank you and I praise in Jesus' name. And all God's people say. May I bless you uh, before, uh, as we end this morning. If you look in the word forgiveness, there's a word uh, that's hidden there. And the word that's hidden in the word forgiveness is, is give. And forgiveness is, is a gift that you give yourself, is a gift that you also give others. So as we uh, come out of here today, I pray that you will experience the gift of forgiveness. And for some of us, the first step of enjoying this gift of forgiveness is actually receiving the gift of forgiveness from God. So if that's you, there will be uh, people from the prayer team that will be here at the front. And may I encourage you to come and to share with the person that you want to receive this gift of forgiveness. Go and enjoy the gift of forgiveness.